Do you like uh, scary stuff? Yeah. Welcome back, travelers. It's time for another stop on our journey through the quirky and unusual bits of history. I'm Z Algar, and you're listening to Travels by Carriage. Today's tale is about trust, theft, and betrayal. Let's ride on. We start in the early 1900s. Picture, if you will, a bright, sunny day. A family is playing on an open, grassy area. And amongst this family, we find the lead character of our story. His name is Thomas Lee, and at the beginning of this story, he's somewhere around his 30s. I was unable to find an official birth year for Mr. Lee. But at this point in his life, he um, has already graduated from Harvard, and he's dropped out of law school. And he's left law school because he decided it wasn't really for him. You see, what Thomas Lee really, really enjoyed was being in the outdoors, in nature, where we find him at the beginning of our tale. So Thomas Lee is spending this summer day in the countryside with his family. They're in upstate New York near a national park. And as they're spending their day together, Thomas notices that none of the um, lawn chairs that the family has are really adapted for this environment. The area that they are has some pretty steep, rocky areas. I mean, nothing too steep because it's a leisurely day. Um, No one's trying to rock climb here, but it it does have some steeper areas. And so the lawn chairs are having trouble standing up on this slope. And Mr. Lee notices this and he's a clever guy. And so it's on this day that he goes out, he grabs some planks of wood and he starts messing around and, and kind of trying to figure out a way to better support these lawn chairs. And he tries out a few things and he gets the opinion of his family. And this launches an interest for him for the next three years Thomas Lee will work on this design, this original idea that he had on this summer day in the year 1900. Um, He will eventually come up with a chair made of wood, and it has one big plank in the back and one big flat plank along the bottom. A couple things that make it different from existing chairs is that the way he put his planks together make it very easy for this chair to sit on a hill or a slope, right? That was kind of his initial goal. So he's really found a chair that does this well. And so he begins making these for his family home near Westport, New York. Now, if you're not familiar Westport, New York is a town in upstate New York, and it's actually inside of the Adirondack State Park, so it had a lot of access to nature. As I mentioned, he loves spending time in the outdoors, um, so he was near Westport quite a bit. Um, And so he made many friends there. And because of these friendships, he eventually comes to um, start gaining some popularity for this chair. I wouldn't say a ton of people were noticing it, but he's having people over for various functions and they notice and comment upon the chair. And this is how one of his close friends um, comes upon the chair. He is immediately taken with this design. He's a carpenter himself, and he is asking questions and wanting to know more about this chair that Lee has invented and started making for himself and his family. And and Lee is just, you know, one of those guys that likes to work with his hands. And so he's excited to share this new creation that he's put three years in, right? I imagine he probably talked about it to his friend along the way. Check out this thing I'm working on, right? Um, So because of this, in the year 1903, we start to get towards cold weather, right? We're coming towards, um, 
Oh, let me let me correct myself. In the year 1904, as we get to winter, this friend of Mr. Lee's is starting to get a little concerned. You see, his primary role was not a carpenter. He was actually a store owner. And with winter time coming up in New York, he was very concerned that his business was going to get hit rather hard. And he just happened to be in a financial situation where he couldn't really afford this. Hashtag can relate. So he's in a financial situation. He can't really he can't really let things go un unfixed. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. At any rate, Lee is close to this guy and he says, you know what? I mean, I have this design for this chair. You've seen the chair. Why don't I just lend you the designs? You can make a couple for the store and let those get you through the winter. Great idea, right? I mean, this is definitely going to help Thomas's friend get through the winter. So his friend, Larry Brunell, I always want to say Burnell, but it is not Burnell. It is Bunnell. So his friend, Larry Bunnell, is like, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. They kind of separate ways, and Bunnell has the designs, and he's going to use these to get through the winter. And they kind of both go their separate ways to get through the season, right? It's 1904. Um, Heating is not what it is today. Winters are hard in upstate New York. So they don't really see each other for a little while. And it's over the course of this time that Bunnell starts selling the chairs, but he takes it a little bit further than what was mentioned. He doesn't make one or two chairs to, you know, maybe three to five chairs to get through the season. No, he starts really pushing out these chairs. Not only that, but he starts tweaking the design a little bit, right? He makes a little change here or there. Maybe that's fine. Maybe he's just perfecting the design, except for when the winter is over and Lee and Bunnell eventually get back together, we find out that during their separation, Bunnell has filed a patent for this chair. Now, various sources argue about what the initial reaction from Lee was when he found out that this close friend that he had lent this invention to um, has gone and patented it. Patented? Did? Oh, gosh has gotten a patent for this item. So different sources say that he reacted in different ways, but here's what they all agree upon. No one told Lee he was going to do this. Bunnell did not clear it with him first. He didn't even mention that he was actually selling like way more chairs than they had kind of originally talked about. Um, And he definitely, 100%, did not talk to Thomas Lee about patenting patenting this invention before he did it. Whoa. Okay, I mean, talk about a stab in the back. He doesn't tell him at all. And wait until I read you this quote from the patent that he actually filed. So here it goes. Be it known that I, Harry C. Bunnell, a citizen of the United States residing at Westport in the county of Essex and the state of New York, have invented a new and useful improvement in chairs. So that's the beginning of this patent. It's patent number 794,777 and it's dated July 18th, 1905. So he patents this. Um, When I first heard this story, and I'm pretty sure I originally came across this as one usually does on Reddit, I'm pretty sure that I heard that Thomas was angry, right? I mean, here's this invention that we don't know what his plans for it were, but now they've been superseded by Larry Bunnell's because here's his name all over this chair. Um, But later sources will argue that he was already from a wealthy family and he was never really interested in distributing the chair anyway. He just really wanted to make this chair for his family. Um, 
who's to say for sure? None of us were there. And no one who was actually there when he found out has ever spoken to tell the tale. And I don't believe any of them are still with us today. What can be said is that I don't think either one of these two men understood the impact this chair was going to have on society, at least here in the U.S., although I think it's very popular in in lots of countries. So here's the thing. Bunnell patents this chair, and he calls it the Westport chair. Like I said, he made some minor changes, but I mean like really, really minor. I couldn't even see the differences in the diagrams. Um, So he patents it the Westport chair, and he starts selling this chair, and let me tell you, he's successful. This thing is like flying off the shelves. And every chair that he sells comes with the patent number stamped on the back of the chair. Now, remember, in this patent, he is very specific to name only himself. Specific is really the wrong word. He's very careful to only name himself as the creator of this chair. He gives no mention whatsoever to Thomas Lee. So I just thought that was kind of like a little extra kick in the back, right? Like, I'll just make sure that every chair that I sell has this stamped on it. Just as a reminder of who got this design patented, who stands to profit from this uh, design. Personally, I just feel like this would make me feel a type of way. And it wouldn't be a good type of way. Okay, so, so far we've kind of followed the story of Thomas Lee. So let's switch gears a little bit and follow his invention. So Thomas invents this chair in the year 1900. He spends three years perfecting it. Then he shares his design with Larry Bunnell, who goes on to patent it behind his back. So what happens after that? Well, Bunnell is not the last person to improve upon the original design. A third person, Mr. Irving Walpen, makes another adaption, adaptation to the seat design. And when he does this, he incorporates a fan-shaped backed pattern. Now, if you haven't figured out what this chair is, let me read for you how Wikipedia describes this chair. Wikipedia says it's an outdoor lounge chair with wide armrests, a tall slated back, and a seat that is higher in the front than the back. So this chair is popularly called the Adirondack chair. How did we get from Adirondack to Westport? Or really from Westport to Adirondack, I should say. Well, Westport is a region in upstate New York that happens to be near the Adirondack Mountain Range. So if you go to adirondack.net, they actually have a whole page on the Adirondack chair and how the name just eventually kind of left that smaller Westport region and took on the name of the larger region around it. Um, So now we call it the Adirondack chair. They're super popular. You see them all the time in beaches beach settings is where I saw them. So it's so funny to me that they were designed to sit on like a hill slope because I've only seen these chairs like in lounge settings and beachy areas. Of course, I'm giving myself away because I live in a beachy area, but what are you going to do? So in 1938, Irving Walpen, he adds the fan-shaped back that you've probably seen on most Adirondack chairs. And then they also become extremely popular because, get this, they're used in sanatoriums for tuberculosis patients. So they put these tuberculosis patients in the chairs because they say that it opens up their chest cavities and they can breathe easier. I'm not sure the science behind that. I mean, it seems fairly sound. I'd love if any scientists are listening or doctors out there. Give us give us your input. So um, this kind of brings us to the end of our tale. I will say that I found um, an article that was an interview with Thomas Lee's nephew. Now, from what I understand, he um, was not there on the day that Thomas Lee found out that um, Bunnell had 
patented his chair behind his back without telling him. But he did say that there were no lasting hard feelings about this. I mean, the two were friends. Um, Thomas did already come from money. So even though this chair becomes hugely successful and Larry goes on to like put the patent number on every chair that he sells. And I don't know, he just comes off as like really arrogant about it to me. Like if you go and read the rest of the patent, he's very much like, I made this. No one else had any input. And I don't know, I just think that would irk me a little bit if I put three years into building something, I let my friend use the design to get through a season, and then we get to the next summer and you've patented it behind my back. I just, um, I think that would give me some heartburn. So according to Thomas Bunnell's, or I'm sorry, Thomas Lee's nephew, there were no lasting hard feelings. And Harry Bunnell's family went on to make a ton of money from this chair that is still hugely popular. Today, the Adirondack chair is rarely made from wood, or if it is, it's definitely more expensive. Um, it's become very popular to make it with this plastic kind of resin material. Uh, I even have some of those in my backyard right now. So I'll close us out today with just a little info about the outdoor furniture market. According to Statista.com, in 2019, $4.96 billion was spent on outdoor furniture, of which many of those were deer and deck chairs. Um, HowStuffWorks.com did a, an interesting article on the Adirondack chair and how it is so well adapted to sloped and sandy environments. And according to them, these chairs usually go for about $20 to $200 per piece. Remember, I mentioned that the wooden chairs tend to cost more. And if you can get your hands on a Larry Burnell still sounds like I want to say Burnell, Larry Bunnell patented chair because, again, he put this patent on the back of every chair that he sold in his store. So if you can get your hands on one of those, it's, it's going to be a pretty penny. They go for quite a bit these days. You can Google it. They come up on eBay. Um, yeah, there are definitely some collectors out there that want that fancy patent on the back. So I'll leave you with that, listeners. Thank you so much for joining me for another stop on our journey through the quirky and unusual bits of history. I'm Z Algar, and you've been listening to Travels by Carriage. See you next time, travelers.